Hello everybody. Well, it's time for a new unit. This unit is on complex and imaginary numbers. So let's talk about what an imaginary number is, first of all. Um, the idea of imaginary numbers has been around since apparently the ancient Greek times. Uh, it was finally coined, the term imaginary, in the 1600s by Descartes, who was a mathematician and a philosopher, a French uh, mathematician and philosopher. Uh, the individual who coined the phrase, I think, therefore I am. Same guy, but uh, he came up with the term imaginary numbers actually as a derogatory term. Um, it wasn't until the 1700s, about 100 years later, that they actually um, started being used. And it wasn't until recently, you know, in modern times, when we discovered that imaginary numbers actually have practical use in areas like engineering and physics. So let's talk about uh, where imaginary numbers come from and then talk about how we use them uh, as an introduction. Um, we know that when we find the uh, zeros or solutions of a function, that means what values of x make the function zero. So for example, if I had the function f of, let me make this uh, black here, if we have the function f of x equals x squared plus 4, and we set f of x equal to 0, in other words, we want to find what values of x make this function 0. I'll subtract 4 from each side, and I'll get x squared equals negative 4. And you know that to get rid of, an x, to get rid of a square, we have to square root both sides. So I get plus or minus the square root of negative 4. Now you already know that in the real world, in terms of real numbers, there is no square root of negative 4. There is no number times itself that gives you a negative number. Because if you have a negative times a negative, you get a positive. And if you have a positive times a positive, you get a positive. So there's actually no way in the real world of multiplying a number by itself to get a negative number. So we solve this problem, um, finding zeros of functions that are not uh, real by creating something called the imaginary unit. And the imaginary unit is labeled little i for imaginary. Okay? The definition of i actually come from, comes from this original definition, and that is that i squared equals negative 1. We can make that a little simpler for our uses by taking the square root of both sides and say that i is the square root of negative 1. So we're going to use this particular unit, this imaginary unit i, when we have a situation where we have a square root of a negative number. Now remember, if we had done this, if we had taken the zeros of a function and we had gotten real answers, those would also be x-intercepts. Real solutions, real roots, Real zeros are x-intercepts because we set y equal to 0 to find x-intercepts, don't we? Well, the reason we don't have real answers or solutions for this particular function is because if you look at that particular function right here, you should know that that is our parent graph, our parabola, moved up four spaces, four units. So actually what we have is a parabola up here. And I hope you can see that that parabola never crosses the x-axis. That's why I don't get any real solutions, real zeros, real roots, because there are no x-intercepts for that parabola. So let's get back to our definition here of i. i is the square root of negative 1, and we'll see how that works. And we'll see how it works by actually using the zeros that we got for this function, specifically this part of it the square root of negative 4. So let's take a look at that. What is the square root of negative 4 now that I have a way of showing that in mathematical terms using our new unit i? Well, you should know from our properties of radicals that I can actually take negative 4 and separate it out into negative 1 plus 4, and then our property says that we can actually separate those two radicals. That's perfectly acceptable. Okay, so we have the square root of negative 1, which we said was i, and the square root of 4, which is 2. 
Now as we start to use I, you'll see that we, um, in terms of formatting and in terms of solving problems, we can treat I as if it were a variable in terms of using formulas and, and, and showing our answers. Now I is not a variable, I has a very definite meaning, the square root of negative one. But in terms of formatting our answers and dealing with it in problems, we can deal with it as if, if, as if it were say an X. So we know that we wouldn't write x2, we would write 2x, wouldn't we? So our answer here is going to be 2i. So what if we just said? We have said that the square root of negative 4 equals 2i. I hope you can see that all you really need to do with these then is to take out the negative and write an i and then treat your square root as if it were a normal positive square root. So for example, if I had the square root of negative 25. I can take out this negative, because that's the square root of negative 1, and write an i. So I have i times the square root of 25. The square root of 25 is 5, so this is 5i. Pretty easy, right? So if I have the square root of negative 49, what would that be? That would be the square root of 49 is 7, and then since it's a negative, we put an i. Okay, not too ter terribly difficult. So all you need to remember is take out the negative, write an i, and then treat your radical the way you would normally treat a radical. But what about if, what if the radical is not of a perfect square? What if I said had the square root of, say, negative 8? Okay, we're going to take out that i for the negative. So we're going to have i, I'm going to take out that negative there and write an i out here i radical 8, but I hope you can see that radical 8 is not simplified. There's at least a 4 in there. Okay, it's not a perfect square though. Let me do it over here. Radical 8 equals, and this is getting back to our last unit, 2 times 2 times 2, that's 8. And then we have a pair of 2's here. We can pull out a 2. So I get 2 radical 2. So this is i times 2 radical 2. Now the question is, where does that i go in our answer? Where do we write it? Well, the, reason, the way I'm going to explain this to you is what if we had had, say, the square root of 8x squared? Wouldn't you have written that answer based on what we did last unit as 2x radical 2? Sure you would have, because you wouldn't have written x2. And as I said, we can treat imaginary numbers just like variables here. So we're going to write 2i radical 2. So the answer to the question I posed was we're going to put the i in between the whole number and the radical when that happens. Let's do one more of these. They're not terribly difficult. How about the square root of negative 54? Okay, first thing we do is what? Pull out that negative and put an i on the outside and now we're going to factor 54. What is 54? 54 is 9, 3 times 3, times 6, isn't it? 9 times 6 is 54. Pull out the 3. Your answer is 3i radical 6. Okay, so just in summary, i is the square root of negative 1. And when we, when we take the square root of negative numbers, we get rid of that negative under the radical by writing an i on the outside. And then we treat our radical as we would normally, as if it were a positive radical. And if our final answer has both a whole number and a radical, we write the i in between those two pieces. And that will do it for um, our initial introduction to the imaginary unit i. Thanks.